The beginning of our prayers this night <clears throat> comes from the second Corinthian letter, chapter 5 and verse 12. And we're going to ask the Lord that we would be able to give an answer to those who glory in appearance. This is the theme of our prayers this evening, our giving an answer or making an answer. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. This, um, this is a very a subtle <clears throat> attack on the faith. Now, we don't, we don't uh, discount that appearance is part of the, the whole of salvation. You can't have a holy people that have an unholy appearance. But our glorying is not in the appearance. It's in the substance which produces the appearance. We are to abstain from every appearance of evil. And we are uh, to, our works are part of our appearance, so to speak. And we're to be full of good works. So we do have an appearance of, of holiness and goodness that comes from God. But see, everything Everything has got to point back. It has to come, proceed from, and it has to point accurately back to the one that produces that. It can't stop in the middle or get redirected. Otherwise, it becomes corrupt. Those that, that glory in appearance, see, that's what they have. They spend all their time on the appearance of things, and then they fall short of, of the glory of God inwardly in an inward man. And uh, it's, it has to be by rote. It isn't a true holiness. It is not the salvation that Christ has accomplished on our behalf. So that makes it of none effect Godward. In fact, uh, it can be, uh, well, it not can be, it is very detrimental to those who are caught up in this because they become pharisaical in the sense that they think that they're whole and they have no need of a physician or that they, um, that they have attained to the righteousness of God and have, have no more need of a continual supply of the grace of God by Christ Jesus to us. They don't understand the true nature of holiness or the new creatureship. They're, they're not abiding in these things. So what we're asking for is that we would be able to give an answer to those who glory in appearance. Now, in, in particular here, Paul had to, to give an answer for those that, that gloried in things like circumcision. Now, we give an answer to people who glory in other things, the fact that they were baptized or the fact that they have um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues or perfect attendance or uh, attain to a certain uh, outward standard that men have recognized of them. You know, oh, he's a very good person. Well, again, we never despise goodness, but this is not the goodness of God. It has got, if you, if it's not of God's making and sustaining and to his glory, then it is only appearance. It is not a true goodness, and you'll have to give an, an, uh, an answer to him. So we want to be able to give an answer to those now, perhaps to assist them in being free of this delusion, and so that we ourselves, see, if you can answer something, that means that you know enough about it, you don't fall into it yourself. If you, if you find yourself in a, a situation where you kind of sense it's not right, but you couldn't really give an answer for it, this is an area that you need to be shored up in your own self because it's an area of weakness in your understanding. So the, uh, much would be accomplished in the Lord's answer to this, both to the benefit of those who can give an answer and can identify that an answer needs to be given, and also perhaps to the uh, retrieval of people who have been caught up 
in that that delusion so that they can receive the, the true the true help, the, the true strength that comes from God alone. So who will lead us in that request? That we would be able, we meaning God's people, be able to give an answer to those who glory in appearance. Brother Jeremy. Sister Laura. All right. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Now we're asking that all saints everywhere would know how they ought to answer every man. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now he's talking about uh, walking before those that are without and redeeming the time. Brethren, we live in an, at a time and in a place where there's a lot of opportunity for the Lord to to give us this, how that we ought to answer every man. See, it's not so simple. You have to have life. You you don't you don't get your, your answer sheet out and walk out the door and go, okay, I've got all the answers, bring it on. And somebody says, Well how come how come you do this? This is number eight. Because and then read a little scripture, a little text proof. And they say well, then how come number, number three, number three, and then you give them that little proof text, and then you walk away very self-satisfied. Well, there, I've done my good deed for the day. No, because, one, a person that challenges is a threat not only to themselves but to those that they have their ear. They can plant seeds of doubt. Yeah. Don't think they can't. A question is a challenge very frequently, but you've got to have enough wisdom to discern when that is a challenge and when it's an honest inquiry also. So somebody might ask you the very same question as another person, but this answer would be the appropriate for the one, and this answer would be appropriate for the other. Because the other person, has they're really not coming from the same place. Sounds like the same thing they're asking, but they're coming from a totally different place. They're seeking something different. Their motive is different. And so you have to be able to answer with wisdom and discernment. And again, we have to know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we have to have, as in everything, see, these, these things require a perception of God's leading also. It isn't the, the um, you know, kind of like, mm, type of experience. But it's walking with God and in the knowledge of God so that so that as the the Spirit will lead us in these things. I know you've had this experience where somebody asks you something and it may it may take you off guard just momentarily, but all of a sudden it's like there it is. The scriptures that that you need to reason on in order to really represent the truth rightly, to represent God's work rightly, it's like they're there. God doesn't leave us uh, alone in these things. That's why we're asking him for this, so that we can serve him in these things also. And be th that's part of our witness, is the things we proclaim. Sometimes it's not just, you know, whenever you stand, you've really been invited to speak, so to speak, because brethren have come here for that purpose, to sit and listen to the things that, that God has shown you. But sometimes this happens impromptu on the street, and God just opens up a door. And you want to be able to walk through it and to take advantage of it. And uh, this, this prayer will cause us to be more ready and more instant, whether in or out of season, in order to do the work of God, either from preventing the... Um, the, the spread of, of doubt and error or, or to be able to really answer the, the cry of a heart that is, is searching. Now, Pilate asks, what is truth? His was, his was not necessarily a, a, a real honest inquiry, but there are people that are really wondering, what is truth? What is the truth? 
And there are other people that are willing to tell them something that's not the truth and sound very authoritative about it. So we yeah. need to be able to tell them what is the truth. So who will lead us in that? That the saints everywhere would know how they ought to answer every man. Sister Tasha, Sister Annie, Brother Tony, Brother Dave, Sister Laura. Amen. And then finally, brethren, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. We're asking that we would all be ready to give an intelligent and godly answer when asked about our hope. Now, I've thought of this often since uh, Brother Given told the story about uh, the young man who was the preterist that he, he asked him, what is your hope? That, that is a very, very good question for almost anybody. What is your hope? Why do you hold to or reject what you hold to or reject? What are you hoping for? Because every person is motivated by, by what they feel or think is going to most advantage them. So in the, in the 15th verse here, Peter writes, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. First you have to know what you're hoping for. Then you have to know why you have a reason to hope in it. In other words, what makes you think you're going to attain to what you're hoping for? On what basis do you have confidence of that hope? And then be able to, to set it forth as God has set it forth. There was a day whenever it dawned on your heart, I can live forever. I don't have to die. I have an inheritance that's promised to me. I have a God who has provided for me a salvation in his own son. Now, see, these things came to us by faith. But giving an answer of your hope will be reason for another person to have faith stirred up in them. The Spirit can work with this. And it's got to... Um, it's sad, but I've asked people that are professing believers what their hope is. And it, it's just sad. I can see why they, they live lives that, that are, um, shall we say, lacking. Why they, they flag in zeal. Why they, they don't give much thought to what they call salvation. Because they're not hoping for very much. They're not living in expectation of the, the glories that are ahead. So other people would say, well, that sounds very vain. That sounds very selfish. You're hoping for, for glory? Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. And if, if, you, if you had faith, you would be hoping for that too. Okay. Why, why should we draw back from, from wanting the goodness of God to be manifested toward us? God is good. This is what he wants to do. This is what he has provided. This is what he wants us to see about himself and to participate in. Yes, I'm hoping for glory. Yes, I'm, I'm, I've cast the weight of my soul on a Savior who can give that an eternal life and to get me there safely. But too many people have not heard very much to hope in. So we're asking... See, the church, this is part of being the, the, ground, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church needs to be ready. Like whether somebody walked in instantaneously, whether we walk out to get the mail and an opportunity presents itself, you meet somebody in the grocery store, you just it doesn't make any difference. You're at work and somebody says something, it makes no difference. Be ready, be ready. So that when it comes to you, it's not a surprise or you don't have to, like, get yourself regrouped. That we would all be ready to give an intelligent and godly answer when asked about our hope. And people are watching. And don't think that they 
that they don't, if they have an honest and a good heart, we don't know who they are. They'll manifest themselves. But yeah. somebody asks you that, you want to be able to give an intelligent and a godly answer, one that the Spirit of God can work in. So who lead us in that request? Brother Aaron. Brother Judah. All right. And um, 